Okay. So um, thank you all for coming. I am Jackie Tileston, Associate Professor in Fine Arts. Thank you for coming to this evening's dialogue, Other Ways of Knowing at the Intersection of Neuroscience and Mysticism. This event is co-sponsored by the Department of Fine Arts yeah. and the SNF Paideia Foundation yeah. as an expansion of my seminar this semester called Mystics and Visionaries, Art and Other Ways of Knowing. The Stavros Niarchos Foundation, SNF Paideia program serves as a hub for civic dialogue in undergraduate education at Penn. SNF PIDEA collaborates with many campus entities to promote opportunities for students to develop the knowledge, skills, ethical frameworks, and experiences necessary to be informed, engaged, and effective community members and leaders in society. The SNF PIDEA program encourages the free exchange of ideas, civil and robust discussion of divergent views, and student and community wellness through SNF PIDEA designated courses, a fellows program, and campus events. Just a reminder to mute yourself, somebody's unmuted. The next co-sponsored event will be on April 1st with Ernesto Pujol on his listening project in conversation with Carol Muller from the music department. In addition, I will also be opening my seminar to visitors on March 16th in order to share a conversation that I'm very excited about, Other Ways of Knowing from Shamanism to Cognitive Trance with Nadine Kreisberger and Corinne Sombra. I will drop the flyer and the link in the chat for any interested parties. In my seminar, we are looking at how various states of consciousness can contribute to knowledge, creativity, and our perceptions of reality. Scholar Jeffrey Kripal said, if we come to see consciousness as being more and more fundamental to the nature of reality, if consciousness turns out to be cosmic, in other words, then suddenly the humanities are not just studying tangential fluff or illusions produced by dying brains. Suddenly, humanists are studying the ultimate nature of reality insofar as that reality is indirectly coded in cultural forms. Science is getting weirder and weirder and more poetic, and we need the widest possible space within which to have these discussions with depth and intellectual flexibility. The mind and noetic territory is perhaps best understood via these multidisciplinary approaches and I've invited speakers from fields adjacent to the arts to participate in expanding our perspective. When I first arrived at Penn, I encountered Dr. Newberg's research into states of consciousness. My first meditation teacher was actually a neuroscientist, and I knew when I was designing this course that Newberg would have to be a guest. Dr. Andrew Newberg's research sits perfectly poised to contribute to our understanding of how we know what we know and how awareness can be experienced at this intersection between science and the ineffable. As the founder of neurotheology, he has done brain imaging studies on various types of meditation, on mediums practicing psychography and on sacred ritual. Newberg is the author of numerous books and articles, including the New Science of Transformation, How Enlightenment Changes Your Brain, How God Changes Your Brain, The Mystic Bind, and many, many others. Justin McDaniel is perhaps best known on campus for his fabled courses, Existential Despair and Living Deliberately, in which students took a vow of silence. A Guggenheim Fellow, he is also the author of several excellently titled books, including Gathering Leaves and Lifting Words, the Lovelorn Ghost and the Magic Monk, Architects of Buddhist Leisure, and the forthcoming Ornaments and Distractions Studies in Thai Buddhism. He is an expert on Thai monastic culture and ritual, a true scholar practitioner. I will now turn it over to Dr. Andrew Newberg for a presentation on his research, and then we'll follow that with some conversation between him and Justin, 
And then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. So please drop your questions into the chat window and remember again to mute yourselves. So uh, I, I thought I would just title my talk, uh, How Enlightenment Changes Your Brain, New Ways of Knowing, and really thinking about uh, what enlightenment is as a term, uh, specifically the kinds of mystical and spiritual experiences that uh, people have, how we can study them, and how we can study them in a variety of ways so that we can enhance what we know about those states, but also understand how knowledge is derived from those states and how it can transform a person's life, a society's life, and, and really a human life. So I think that there is a I wanted to talk about enlightenment as a kind of focus here so that we could start to think about these incredible experiences that people have that are often described as enlightenment. And many different words uh, have been used to help us understand. Uh, so let's talk about enlightenment a little bit. Um, enlightenment has been referred to in many different ways. Knowledge um, it, uh, it was I made this slide long before I, I was planning on giving this talk and knowledge was one of the first uh, terms that has been used in the context of enlightenment. Uh, wisdom, awakening, truth, uh, holiness, revelation, so many different ways of thinking about this term. And that in and of itself is a fascinating issue. Uh, it, um, it makes us have to think a little bit about what enlightenment is, what mystical experiences are that are often referred to as enlightenment and how, they inter how these kinds of experiences intersect with our brain, with our body, and how we think about things. So uh, I did just uh, make this slide uh, a little bit before the presentation, so I apologize, it may not be the most aesthetically pleasing slide, but I was trying to just make a very important point here, which is that we can look at the relationship between our brain, our religious and spiritual selves, and concepts of wisdom and knowledge, and I really wanted to make sure that all of these arrows are bi-directional because we can talk about how our brain contributes to the ability for us to develop wisdom and utilize wisdom. We can think about how the brain intersects with spirituality. We can think about how spirituality helps to affect our brain or how it affects our wisdom. And so there's a lot of interwoven possibilities here when we start to think about the overall relationship between our brain, our spiritual selves, and what we ultimately refer to as knowledge or wisdom. Now, another point about enlightenment, which I think is worth just talking about for a few moments, is what exactly you know, do we mean by that and how do we think about it in different ways? So one of the things that we realized in our own research and thinking about what's going on in the brain and how we relate enlightenment to the brain is that people seem to describe two main types of enlightenment experiences, which we dif differentiated as kind of the big E versus the little E experiences. The little E experiences generally are smaller ones, and that is why we were using the lower case. Um, basically, what we're talking about is kind of shedding some light on a particular topic, on some specific thing, that a person might be trying to resolve. So the little e experiences tend to be these kind of aha moments where we suddenly realize how to solve a problem, how to deal with some life issue. Um, typically they change the direction of our life in some kind of way, but usually on a small level and on a very specific level. And that is very distinguished between what we might refer to as the big e experiences in which our entire worldview is radically transformed. Everything that we think about ourselves, about how we interact with the world and about the world completely changes. So these are in many ways the, the highest experiences or the most intense experiences that an individual can attain. And there are examples of such experiences in virtually every religion, every culture and across, uh, across time. You know, a lot of their, there's evidence that these experiences go back thousands of years. So uh, when we think about enlightenment around the world, um, first of all, the term enlightenment, usually we think a little bit more in terms of Eastern philosophies, which define enlightenment as, as some kind of highest level of consciousness that a person can attain. And depending on the tradition, there are slight variations on this. And this is just a very rough summary. Um, there's so many more things, 
every one of these could be a topic of a, of a whole course, uh, let alone a, a half hour talk. But uh, in Hinduism, uh, consciousness is seen as the essence from which the universe emerges and enlightenment means that you basically become one with this fundamental reality. In Taoism, the, the concept is getting in touch with the harmony and the principles of nature, the flow of life, and that that is what enlightenment is defined as. In Buddhist thought, enlightenment tends to be a bit more personal. It's brought about through some kind of process of self-reflection, meditation. In Zen Buddhism, a slight variation on that theme, uh, enlightenment tends to be reached through some kind of uh, process in which they recognize a radical truth that, uh, that basically the world as we know it is kind of a, an illusion of the mind. And by achieving enlightenment, we understand the world in a fresh way, in a new way that we never thought of before. In the monotheistic traditions, um, while we don't hear the term enlightenment used quite as much, uh, there is certainly a lot going on that sounds a lot like the enlightenment that we see in Buddhism, Hinduism, and, and many of the Eastern traditions. So in Judaism and, and uh, Islam, Christianity, there are many uh, mystical estates where people form some kind of union with God and through that union with God come to know the universe, come to know God, come to know themselves and come to know the universe in a way that they never have before. So these kinds of intense spiritual experiences, mystical experiences, enlightenment experiences, I hate to use each of these terms somewhat uh, synonymously, but but there is a tremendous amount of overlap. And, and again, through my own research and asking people about these experiences, people do use a lot of these same kinds of terms. Uh, I think one of the interesting challenges of neurotheology, actually, just to make a parenthetical note, is that um, we really need to think about definitions and try to figure out how we distinguish these various terms from each other. But that is also for another time. <clears throat> One important point about enlightenment is that the age of enlightenment, which occurred back in the 1700s for the most part, took enlightenment in a completely different way. It basically said that enlightenment was a move away from religion and spirituality. It was based more on rational processes, cognition, scientific pursuits. The idea was, was that uh, we were in this kind of state of ignorance and this con would talk about you know, basically, we were talking about enlightenment as, as freeing humanities, uh, human consciousness from this state of ignorance. So it was really kind of a freedom from religion instead of using religious or spiritual beliefs as a way of achieving enlightenment. So when we think about knowledge and enlightenment, it's quite remarkable that there are so many different ways of looking at this, both from a deeply spiritual and a deeply non-spiritual kind of context. But we may be able to think about this in the context of neurotheology by trying to see where the similarities are among all of these different kinds of experiences. So we can start to think a little bit more about the brain and how what's going on in the brain when an experience like an enlightenment experience occurs. And we talk a lot in, in my own research, I talk a lot about different parts of the brain. So I know not everyone is a neuroscientist, so I just want to get everybody uh, more or less on the same page here. Uh, here we are looking at a kind of side view of the brain and a couple of important areas I think are worth pointing out. One of them is towards the front of the brain, the frontal lobes, which I've also listed here as an attention area. Uh, this is an area of our brain that turns on when we focus our attention. So if we're focusing on a meditation practice, on an object, on a prayer, we tend to see increases of activity in the frontal lobe. On the other hand, as we'll see a little bit later, when the frontal lobe goes down, we sort of give over our attention. We, we, we kind of surrender our attention, our consciousness, if you will, to an experience and allow it to just kind of happen to us. And we'll see a little bit about what's happening uh, on brain scans when people have these kinds of experiences. In the back part of the brain called the parietal lobe is an orientation part of our brain. And it takes our sensory information and helps us to spatially create a sense of ourself and to differentiate that self from the world. So this area turns on to create our sense of self. And if that area were to start to shut down, we might see a loss of that sense of self, a blurring of the boundaries between ourself and the rest of the world. And so we might think about what's going on in this area during these intense spiritual experiences. There are other areas as well, a verbal conceptual area, which sits at the junction 
of the temporal lobe along the side of the brain and the parietal lobe. So when we talk about wisdom and knowledge and abstract ideas, this is an area that is most likely very involved in helping us to be able to think about the world in certain ways and to be able to think about how we might start to understand uh, what uh, these different experiences are all about. Deeper inside the brain is a group of structures referred to as the limbic system that many of you may know of. The, uh, the limbic system is in many ways our emotional center of the brain. It also helps to write things into memory. So intense, important experiences are written into our brain so that we remember them in the future. And that's part of how we think these kinds of intense spiritual experiences affect our brain in such an intense way and change the way we think, we remember, uh, and how we understand the world around us. So two important structures, the amygdala and the hippocampus, which are very close to each other, they tend to turn on when we have an intense spiritual experience because we might feel a profound sense of joy, love, um, excitement, awe, whatever the, the different emotional responses may be. And that ultimately is felt within the brain and also writes those experiences and whatever is part of those experiences into the brain itself. Now, it's great to talk about what's going on in the brain, but as I have learned over the years and I think is essential element of what neurotheology is all about, is that we need to ask the question of what do people actually experience? What is the phenomenology of the experience itself? What are people really feeling? We need to understand that so that we can understand what the experiences are, what kinds of knowledge or information is derived from those experiences. And again, to me, the only way we can know that is by asking the questions. So uh, starting from when I was at the University of Pennsylvania and through my time here at Jefferson, uh, we've run an online survey, it, it probably even a little bit longer than five years now, that, um, that basically asked people about their most intense spiritual experiences. And we received over 2,000 responses from people from all different traditions from around the world. Uh, so very exciting data that we have started to publish uh, a number of articles on about these experiences. We asked them just basic demographic information about who they were, what their religious and spiritual backgrounds were. We gave them questionnaires to assess their religiosity, their mental health, and, and uh, asked them questions about their physical and mental health. Uh, we also then ultimately asked them to provide a narrative description of their experience, to actually give them a box. And we said, uh, tell us about your experience. We wanted it to be very open-ended so that we could allow people the freedom to express themselves in as many different ways as possible, and then put all of this information together so that we could think about what these experiences are like to see where the commonalities are across all these traditions and cultures and so forth, uh, as well as think about how we bring the brain into our understanding of what these experiences are about. So I wanna share with you some of the results from this survey and how it intersects with our brain. First of all, we have this word cloud that described, uh, when we look at all of the words that are used from these different uh, descriptions, these are the most prominent words that, uh, that came across. So uh, words such as reality, uh, experience, God, time, life, uh, and, and oneness, for example, one or oneness. So um, these are some of the most prominent words that people use when they were talking about their experiences. And in and of itself, I mean, this was just a very cute way of kind of diving into what the information was about, but fascinating to see how people start to describe these experiences and where the commonalities are across those experiences. Now, when we looked at these descriptions and when we also thought a little bit more about the brain itself, we came up with the idea that there seemed to be about five core components of enlightenment experiences. Uh, these include the experience that are, th these are the core components, the components of intensity, of clarity, of unity, of surrender, and of permanence or transformation, something that kind of changes the person for, for the, for, forever and for the good. So let's, I wanna look into each of these a little bit more detail, both in terms of what I mean by these terms, uh, as well as what we think is going on in the brain when people have these uh, aspects of these experiences. So here was a description. Um, this is a, a description in my view of a feeling of intensity. It came from a 43 year old male 
And he said this, he said, I was, I as an unnameable but individual being was traveling down an infinite roller coaster like waves of pure ecstatic white light. The ecstasy was overwhelming and rose and fell in intensity with the waves of light. The light path seemed infinitely long in both directions. The sense of the being and the light was infinitely more real, and those capitals, capitalizations were provided by the person, not by me, than anything I had ever experienced before. So we see so many terms here about the intensity of the experience. It was ecstatic, it was overwhelming, it was infinite. Um, so these ideas are very important in terms of making people realize what these experiences are and that they are distinguished from our everyday reality experiences. Now, where in the brain might we have this kind of feeling of intensity? Well, I think in large part, this goes back to the areas of our brain, like the amygdala and the hippocampus, the emotional centers of the brain. Because when we feel something very prominent, very important that we need to pay attention to that feels very intense, we would expect activation in the limbic system of the brain. So what you're seeing here is a brain scan. This is a what's called a SPECT scan that involves injecting a little bit of a radioactive tracer into a person while they're in a particular state. So we can inject them while they're in prayer, while they're in meditation, while they're having some intense uh, experience. And we can see the areas of the brain that are turned on or turned off. Uh, this tracer follows blood flow, which tends to be a good marker for how we look at brain function. And the red areas are the most active, followed by the yellow, the blue, and the black. The top of the scan is the frontal lo lobe. So it's basically, you're kind of like looking up at a person from their feet, the person's lying down. So the top of the scan is the frontal lobe, is like the forehead, and the back, the bottom of the scan is the back of the head. So where the arrow is pointing is looking at the temporal lobe, which is where the limbic system sits. And you can see, in this initial scan, when they were just at rest, that there's you know, a little bit of red activity going on where that arrow is in that limbic system. But look at what happens when the person is engaged in a very powerful meditation practice that it elicits very strong emotional reactions. You can see that all of a sudden this area gets a lot more red. So the amygdala, the hippocampus, these areas turn on and identify for the person that it is a very intense experience which is happening for them. Now, the second component of these experiences is what I like to refer to as a sense of clarity. Uh, this is a description of what this sense of clarity is or means for a person. This was a 37-year-old female scientist, and she said this. She said, everything in life seemed to click. I had this clarity, and it was as if I was looking at life from the inside out. Despite my trepidation, this experience seemed to satisfy my proof-oriented mentality with the concept of intuition. It was almost as if my intuition from somewhere deeper had offered some sort of direct experience that offered a proof. So for this person, it was a sense that they, they, find, they understood things. Um, this sense, you know, it's kind of like, I get it. I understand for the first time what the world is like, how I'm supposed to interact with it, who I am as a person, uh, whether there's a God or not, whatever the person experiences, they feel like it is something that they now understand in a way that they never have before. Now, an area that we think might be involved in this is where these arrows are pointing. And these two little red dots that are in the center of the brain, I haven't mentioned this area yet, uh, are, are a, a, a group of structures called the thalami. Uh, there's a left and a right, and you can see the two dots there. And the thalamus, or the thalami have a number of very important functions for the brain. For one, they allow sensory and auditory input to come up into the brain. So our whole ability to construct a perspective of reality through our vision and through our hearing in part is processed through the thalamus. The thalamus also, as you can see, it's a very central structure. So it connects all the different parts of the brain, the frontal lobes and the parietal lobes and so forth. So it enables all the different parts of our brain to be able to work together to create a very vivid and three-dimensional picture of what our world is about and how we interact with that world. The thalamus also, there's been some evidence to suggest that it is even, uh, as some might argue, the seat of consciousness. Um, it may be at least the seat of wakefulness because the thalamus shuts down when we are anesthetized. 
And then when we wake up, the thalamus turns on. So whether or not it's exactly the, the seat of a self-reflexive consciousness is a slightly different story. But certainly, as you can see, it is a very important part of our brain. So here is the, a, an example of a brain scan of someone who's just a regular person who had never really done a whole lot of meditation before. And I'm gonna contrast this with a person who had been engaged in meditation practices for many, many years and had several intense enlightenment types of experiences. So right now in the, in the, the non-meditator, you can see that the left and the right side are pretty similar in activity. But in the meditator's brain, one side of the thalamus becomes much more active. And we see this in a number of practices as well. In fact, we did a longitudinal study where we showed a shift in thalamic activity as the result of doing a practice. So this central area of our brain, which is so fundamental to helping us to establish like what our view of reality is about, changes as the result of intense experiences and practices like, like meditation and prayer then perhaps this is part of the brain that is involved in shifting that sense of clarity and that sense of knowledge within us. The feeling of unity is also a fundamentally important part of the experience. I mentioned this earlier that a feeling of unity may be involved with the parietal lobes that normally take our sense of our, all of the sensory information, a lot of it coming from the thalamus, and helps us to create a three-dimensional picture of the world around us, uh, gives us a spatial sense of ourself and a boundary between ourself and the world. Well, if that area of the brain starts to shut down, then you lose that ability to form the boundary. You lose that sense of space and you have a sense of oneness, maybe a sense of the oneness of God, if that's the focus of your, your prayer practice, a oneness of all things. And it may even help in terms of how we think about conceptually understanding the notion of God or a universal consciousness of some kind, that we need to bring all of the different parts of the universe together into some fantastic whole. So when we look at the parietal lobes, uh, which is where the arrow is pointing, as I mentioned, what we tend to see, here is the brain of a Buddhist meditator at rest. And we can see that the left and the right side of the parietal lobes are pretty equal and actually pretty comparable to the frontal lobes as well. But during intense meditation, that area of the brain gets much quieter. Now you can see it's almost all in yellow on that whole side of the brain as their sense of self and their experience of how their self interacts with the world starts to substantially change. So this notion of a sense of unity and oneness seems to be very important in many of these experiences. In fact, pretty much in all of these experiences and is a, a very prominent component of what makes these experiences so powerful for the individual. Another component, the fourth one is the sense of surrender. And this is an example of somebody describing this. This was a 48 year old Catholic woman and she described her experience this way. She said, I surrendered everything, including my faith and my salvation, and only for one reason. I loved God so much that I would truly give up everything to be connected with him. I said yes, and in an instant, God returned everything to me transformed. From that day forward, a new relationship exists between God and me, which is ever present, no distance, no separation. I am not attached to doctrine, dogmas, or ritual. I see God's actions all around me. So here is a person who, through the process of surrender, had this incredible spiritual experience that ultimately connected them with God. There's no, God is ever present. There's no distance. There's no separation. So this is actually a nice little example of not only a sense of surrender, but that sense of oneness and unity as well. So where does that sense of surrender come from? Well, I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that the frontal lobes tend to turn on when we are purposely trying to make things happen. So what would happen if the frontal lobes shut down? And this is exactly what we see in certain practices. This was a study of Islamic prayer practice. And of course, in Islam, the whole concept is to surrender to God. And you can see that the, where these arrows are, that there are some reds and yellows there. But look at what happens when the person is deep within the Islamic prayer practice. This area almost goes away. It turns into these you know, more deeper green colors. So the ability, I'll just go back and forth one more time for that. 
you can see kind of the reds and yellows, and then it kind of disappears into the green. So we see this in a number of practices where the person describes a loss of purposeful process going on. They feel taken over by the experience. They're no longer making it happen, but it is something that is happening to them. And that is also a fundamentally important component of these experiences. No matter how long a monk may spend years and years and years trying to achieve enlightenment, when it starts to happen to them, it's like they just, they're along for the ride and it just happens to them. And this is, again, very common across all traditions, all cultures, and all of these kinds of experiences. The last part that I want to talk about in terms of the components, and then we'll, we'll wrap up my presentation here before we start to open the discussion up, is this transformative piece, that there are permanent and transformative elements that arise from the Enlightenment experience. So we asked them some basic questions about whether their relationships, their fear of death, their overall sense of health, their sense of purpose and meaning in life, and their religious and spiritual attitudes, how did they change as the result of having this experience? Did they get better? Did they get worse? What happened to them? And to me, the results were really pretty remarkable. Um, I mean, if you look at the, the somewhat worse and worse, um, and or much worse, it's like a couple of percent. So 90 to 95% of people having these experiences said that as a result, something improved within them. And some of this particularly prominent when it comes to things like spirituality and religiousness. So this to me is really an incredible to see how it these, these experiences change people. And as a neuroscientist, can you guys hear me? Yes. Is I'm still with you? Yes. Okay, sorry, my picture seems to have frozen here <laughs> uh, on my screen. So um, uh, the result of these experiences is that uh, there is a, a very fundamental change that occurs. And as a neuroscientist, what is particularly intriguing is how this happens in such a short moment of time. What seems to be happening is that in a relatively brief moment, sometimes seconds, uh, this, this, this whole experience radically changes every aspect of that person's life. So this is not how we think about knowledge getting into our brain. I mean, normally we think about going through school, years of training and so forth that ultimately change our brain over time. But in a moment, these experiences seem to radically change everything about the person. And I will just touch for a moment on the, the people who said that these experiences made things worse. Because neurotheology also recognizes that while spiritual experiences and, and religious beliefs are often very positive for people, there can be a negative side. Sometimes it can be a true negative side. Sometimes people have these experiences and it overwhelms them, it scares them, they don't know what to do with it. Sometimes they have trouble um, incorporating the experience into their own belief system. So it's not always clear why these experiences occasionally go bad, but this is something for us to think about and to learn from and to think about what changes are going on in the brain when people do have these kinds of negative experiences that may lead them down very bad pathways, including into cults or other types of very destructive types of behaviors. Uh, other survey results that we got included that a majority of the participants reported that these experiences felt more real than their usual sense of reality. Uh, this has been a part of these experiences that has fascinated me from the beginning, that when people say that they have an intense mystical experience, that they describe it as being, as not just being real, but as being more fundamentally real than our everyday reality experience. Now, all of us understand this because we have all seen this shift in our perceptions of reality. The most common one for all of us is when we have a dream. And no matter how real a dream feels for us, when we wake up, we recognize the dream as an inferior reality. What's the first thing we say? Oh, that was just a dream. So no matter how scary it was or how great it was, when we wake up, we realize that that's not really real. And that now we're in our everyday reality experience, that that's the real reality. But when people have a mystical experience, they, it, it's as if they are waking up out of a dream and they say, 
now I am having the real experience of reality and the everyday reality experience is sort of like the dream reality. Um, so that's why sometimes you hear, and for example, Buddhist uh, tradition sometimes talks about everyday reality as being a kind of illusion. And it's not so much that it's an actual illusion per se, although some people do believe that as well, but it's just that it doesn't represent the real reality in the same way as the mystical experience does. So the quality of realness is a fundamentally important part of these experiences, and it's associated with very positive uh, mental health, physical health, um, spiritual health perspectives that the people take. And participants whose experiences reported as feeling more real also had these incredible feelings of connection, a sense of a greater whole. Uh, they talked about themselves less as a, as a self. So again, that sense of oneness and unity. So all of these different components seem to be, you know, kind of wrapped up into these experiences, which is part of the noetic ability quality uh, of these experiences. So in the end, you know, when we start to think about, well, what is really real? Well, you know, here we have our everyday reality experience, which is part of where science is. And we use science to understand our brain and how we, you know, how we think about the world around us, how we try to look at the world and break it down into its fundamental parts. But we have this religious and spiritual experience that is another way of looking at the world. So how do we how do we think about this? You know, what do we do and how do we compare the everyday reality experience to what we might refer to as an absolute unitary reality, some kind of mystical enlightenment reality where people look at the world in a completely different way? Um, and, and, and again, you know, the sense of realness of the enlightenment experience. Uh, it also winds up playing an interesting twist on the term because you can achieve enlightenment, which kind of refers to the moment of enlightenment, but you can have enlightenment or be enlightened, meaning that you're kind of perpetually in that new state of being. And ultimately, I hope that neurotheology is a field of scholarship that can look at this relationship between the brain and these experiences to help us better understand how do we how do we actually differentiate everyday reality from these mystical experiences? And is there some way of knowing which of these perspectives of, of reality really is the real one? And how do we do that? And there's some you know, fascinating philosophical, theological, and scientific questions for us to address. So in the end, um, enlightenment has a tremendous impact on the brain as well as the person. It transforms a person's view about pretty much everything their sense of reality, their sense of relationships, jobs, God, science, you know, pretty much everything. And these experiences, therefore, are associated with a profound sense of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding about the world around us, as well as about our own self. And the last thing I just want to add, which to me is an optimistic uh, way of looking at this, but, but I think appropriate when we looked at the thousands of different descriptions that we had, is that uh, both anyone can have these experiences and everyone can have these experiences. And the reason I say that is one, that if you look at every one of our brains, they are fundamentally the same. We all have frontal lobes, temporal lobes, parietal lobes. They're all connected a little bit differently that make us who we are individually. But in terms of their basic functions and how they work for us, for the most part, everyone should be able to have these kinds of experiences. So, uh, so I think you know, that's a really positive takeaway here. And when you look at the descriptions of the people who have, you know, who, who have talked to us about their experiences, we realize that it's not just for the monks and the nuns and the incredibly spiritual individuals, but so many just, you know, quote unquote, regular people of every background, of every tradition, of every age, of every gender, of every culture can have these experiences. So I think to me, this is a very powerful area for us to look at in terms of the future research of neurotheology, as well as just trying to understand religion, spirituality, as well as the human brain and consciousness that will hopefully lead us to an enlightenment of all individuals and of humanity itself in a global kind of way. So for those of you who are interested in exploring all of this in more detail, um, uh, I have published a, a number of books, including How Enlightenment Changes Your Brain, and also, whoops, uh, a book called Neurotheology, if you're interested in looking more detail at uh, neurotheology itself and what that has to offer.
And anyone is welcome to go to my website to uh, learn a little bit more about some of the brain scan studies that we've done, uh, as well as whatever new uh, uh, articles and books uh, come down the road. So we are looking at so many different new ideas and uh, new ways of looking at these questions and exploring different traditions. Uh, so uh, as much as we have learned, we really have just scratched the surface. And uh, to me, it's very exciting that we have a long way to go and a lot more for us to learn about uh, all of these things, which will teach us more about who we are as human beings and how we interact with the universe around us. So uh, we have lots of great questions. Um, I'm going to start off with just, just really kind of two of my own. Um, and then I'm going to open it up to several questions that have come out. Uh, so really great talk. Thank you so much. I, every time you speak, I, I, I enjoy it. And I enjoyed your publications for, for years. Um, one thing I will... One thing I will ask, um, based on my experience, both in a monastery and both uh, with my courses with students, is um, how much uh, physicality uh, is involved in the uh, awakening experiences. And so that whether it's monastic life and say Catholicism or Buddhism or to a lesser extent, meaning that they don't have extensive monastic celibate or monastic experience, but Sufis and Brahmanic ascetics and things like this, um, is that, you know, all of these monastic traditions and ascetic traditions start off with the body first. So it's, it's not about cerebral, it's not about thinking, it's not about interpretation, it's about fasting and celibacy and silence and physical austerities. And is that there's an Incredible lifestyle change in terms of how you eat and how you walk and how you sleep and how you communicate. Do you find in any of your studies is that on brain imaging is that um, people talk about their lifestyles outside of it, what they're doing in terms of exercise or what they're doing in terms of, of physical austerities or of restrictions or denials? Um, yeah, uh, so uh, great question. Um, you know, the um, uh, I guess the short answer is is that uh, I think all of those different elements will have an impact on the brain and probably are you know as as has been realized um, help to facilitate those kinds of experiences. Now um, they may have an impact on the brain in different kinds of ways. So, for example, uh, fasting may alter your brain's neurochemistry. You know, it might change uh, the neurotransmitters in the brain, um, especially if it's prolonged fasting. Uh, you can get into different kinds of states, different metabolic states that change the way your brain cells are actually working that may ultimately, you know, in, in some ways, if you kind of slow down the neural processes of the brain, then some of those shutting downs of the frontal lobe or the parietal will become easier because they're, they're, they're already shutting down, uh, you know, different, uh, different rituals. Um, uh, we didn't really get into, uh, you know, there's, there's so much to get into, but um, one of the things we didn't, I didn't talk about was the autonomic nervous system, which basically is what connects the brain and the body and helps to regulate uh, kind of the arousal as well as the calming mechanism in the brain. Mm -hmm. And so different rituals, which can include movement, uh, you know, drumming music, uh, various, you know, body, you know, bowing and, ge and gestures and so gestures and so forth. Um, those all activate that autonomic nervous system in different kinds of ways. Sometimes they can activate it in a profoundly calming way. So if you're, you're saying, ohm, you know, very slowly over and over again, then you slow the whole body down and you slow the autonomic nervous system down. On the other hand, if you have rapid drumming or, or dancing or something like that, then that revs everything up. And, and, and both can be effective in ultimately leading to these kinds of intense spiritual experiences. So, uh, and, and actually in those intense spiritual experiences, we actually have argued that both sides of the autonomic nervous system are involved and become activated. And that's why they become, you know, they're very intense experiences, but they're also very blissful experiences. Um, so, so I think absolutely, um, you know, those kinds of um, parts of those practices are relevant. And, um, you know, we can, uh, I, there hasn't been tons of data on that. Like, I don't know if there's been a study that has really shown, like, if you meditate while fasting versus meditate without fasting, you know, there's a difference, 
but certainly we have we have talked about this in some of the work that I've done. In fact, I was with fasting in particular. I've been working with a student from Penn um, who uh, you know we've been talking about trying to understand that physiology more and and how that may help to elicit those kinds of experiences. So. Uh, so definitely really, you know, I think it's a really important point that you brought up. And by the way, I, I think I'm, I, I was <laughs> having problems with my computer. So uh, I, I sort of lost a little bit of, I, I don't know if it was you or somebody else who was making comments about the term enlightenment. Right. And um, yeah, and, you know, I, I guess I was trying to say that at the very beginning, you know, I, I was kind of using the term um, in part because that was the title of the book <laughs> that I wrote. Um, and, you know, it certainly is a well-known term. Um, but I, you know, from a neurotheological perspective, I think, you know, looking at those other terms, awakening, uh, uh, you know, mystical uh, oneness, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, there's so many uh, ecstasy. Yeah, yeah. Well, you put up the slide in the beginning with it. I mean, there's so many. Yeah. Right, there's so many terms, right? That you can... There's so many terms, and and I think a really interesting question, again, both from a kind of um, philosophical or theological, you know, from a religious perspective or spiritual perspective, as well as from a scientific one, is are those terms really synonymous? Right. And if, you know, so if I question, which as we did in our survey, you know, a thousand people, and I have, you know, if I take fifty people who said I found enlightenment, and then I have another fifty people who said I was awakened, um, is that really the same thing? You know, is, do they is, are they really talking about the same thing that they're just using different words to describe it based on their traditions that they came from, or are they fundamentally different kinds of experiences and um, I mean, I, I think there's always going to be a lot of overlap, but it would be interesting to know, you know, whether or not we could actually differentiate those terms uh, in some specific way, or are they really pretty synonymous? And, and that's for us to, to continue to look into those kinds of questions. I agree. I, I think I absolutely. And that actually leads, and I'm, I'm just going to ask this one real quick question that I want to open up to the audience. That leads me perfectly to the question is that you know, Wayne Proudfoot wrote this, I mean, about 20 years ago, I think you remember the Religious Experiences book, um, is that everyone's experience of enlightenment or religious experience is what he called already interpreted, meaning that because they're using cultural embedded language, because they're losing the language they brought up, they grew up with, like you had the 48-year-old Catholic woman, I'm a 48-year-old Catholic man, and right. so like, that using terms like God and using terms like surrender, I mean, I grew up using terms like sacrifice and surrender and God, like, you know, so a religious experience that I'm going to have, even though I've lived in Asia for many years and study Buddhism, it's probably still going to be culturally coded. The language is that I'm going to interpret it as, as a God experience, right? Is that, right. and so you, I mean, you did a huge survey, I mean, 2000 people, that's a really big survey. And so you're obviously seeing this massive amounts of, of different, you know, narratives and it's notoriously difficult to do narrative studies, right? And then, right. Um, but then the word cloud was fascinating. And I was like, maybe my eyes are bad, but I, I couldn't see the words that weren't being used, like, or the words that were really, really small. Like, you know, do we find in a sense that people who are Muslim or, or Christian or Jewish, they're tending to use God language or language of oneness, a language of the numinous? Right. Language of sacrifice, language of surrender. And do we find that people who are Taoist or, you know, are Buddhist, they are using languages that are about, you know, um, compassion or warmth or, or connection, you know? It, right. And, you know, and it goes back to your point is that, is this all the same experience that we're just, you know, we're, we're drawing the map of the same territory in slightly different ways, right? Yeah. Well, no. <laughs> I mean, all, all the all really terrific ideas and 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 points. And part of the the short answer is is that I, I don't know. You know, even with that number of 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 descriptions, um, I don't know if we have enough data to be able to say certain. You know, to address some of those questions. But uh, you know, one of the things that was fascinating to me were to try to you know look at the people who said that the experience was completely different than anything that they had ever sort of thought of before. Um, so you know, sometimes you had Catholics who did have a more traditional God experience, but then you had others who had a different kind of, this sort of oneness experience mm -hmm. that they said, well, that really wasn't what we were taught, you know, and we don't, I, I, I didn't even know what to do with that kind of thing is what they're saying. So, um, but yeah, you know, uh, obviously a lot of our, um, the beliefs and the, the, the prevailing system of ideas that we have going into an experience will, will shape that experience. 
but what is fascinating is that for you know for certain people um it seems that those experiences do just kind of blow those things out of the water and um especially when they get to the whole discussion about the experiences being ineffable um and and then uh which i always kind of find it slightly amusing because they always say it was completely indescribable but let me tell you about it um so, uh, i know the thing is yeah there's a there's the volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes of like Jewish Kabbalah and Sufi mysticism. And they think it's like, but they all say it's inevitable. But right. they write volumes on it. Right. Exactly. Um, so yeah, exactly. But but so, again, I mean that's you know, that's that's the challenge of who we are as human sure. beings and, and how we have to have to think about it. But but you know, it also gets to this issue also of knowledge, I think, mm -hmm. which is, you know, which which part of the experience is really, you know, the essence of the experience. Was it the experience itself, which somehow the person kind of phenomenologically knows, you know, because that's the experience they had versus trying to explain it and whether they're trying to explain it to you or to themselves, um, you know, that, that that's a whole that's the whole fundamental problem of just consciousness studies. I mean, I I can't even explain to you what the flavor of chocolate is unless you've, you know, you, you, you've tasted it yourself. It's very hard to to use terms that that you know unless you really understand what it feels like um and that's the challenge with all of these kinds of experiences absolutely absolutely no great point great point we have so many great questions coming in from the audience um and just to be fair i'm going to go with um uh some of the first questions and then we'll see how many we can get through and then and then okay. professor tileson i think you can 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 tell me when to stop um so the first question um and i'm fascinated by this uh, because I'm really interested in the work by David Yadin, um, by Famita Handy. Um, she asked, uh, can enlightenment experiences come from psychedelic drugs? <laughs> well, yeah, so you mentioned David, who a great uh, colleague of, of ours, um, and, uh, and some of the work that's being done down at Johns Hopkins, where he is right now. Um, but, you know, I mean, obviously the use of psychedelics has been around for thousands of years. Um, shamanic cultures around the world have turned to mushrooms and ayahuasca and, and a variety of other uh, compounds to help induce different kinds of experiences. So uh, clearly they are capable of inducing experiences within people. Um, the data that we have, uh, especially some of this recent data out of Johns Hopkins suggests that um, it is uh, every bit as perceived, per perceived to be every bit as spiritual as the more, you know, quote unquote, naturally occurring spiritual experiences. David and I uh, co-authored a paper together on that very topic based on that survey and uh, we looked at the you know several hundred people who said i had it under psychedelic experience and uh under psychedelic uh, drugs and other people who said that they didn't and the descriptions are remarkably similar so um from a neurotheological perspective it's also exciting because we know where these drugs go so we know that psilocybin goes to the serotonin system and therefore you know uh when we if, if any of you go to some of my articles and, and, and books about the overall model that we're trying to develop here, you know, it's not just frontal lobe turns on, parietal lobe turns off or whatever, but it's what's happening to dopamine, what's happening to serotonin, um, all the different neurotransmitters that are going on in the brain that are all part of this process as well. But the, the, the last thing I wanna say about the psychedelics, which to me is also really important in the context of this larger discussion um, of, of all of these uh, different presentations is that, in, the, in kind of the Western medicine uh, perspective, we tend to think about um, the, uh, you know, if you take a drug that it is, you know, it, it's basically artificial, you know, it, it's not a real experience. And that's a bit of our bias, you know, that we look at it that way. Uh, on the other hand, part of what we also, uh, there's another way to me of thinking about that. Uh, for a shaman who takes a, a you know, magic mushroom, um, it is a doorway into the spiritual world. And, you know, the analogy that I always use is that I wear glasses. And so when I wake up in the morning, um, the world's a very blurry place. And I put my glasses on and I see the world clearly. Now the world didn't change, but my perception of it changed. So who's to say that taking a, a drug like psilocybin isn't kind of like putting glasses on the brain and seeing the world in a different kind of way. We, we know that there's lots of things going on in the world that we don't perceive. We don't perceive infrared and ultraviolet and radio waves and all that, but they all are out there. 
So, you know, who's to say that by changing our, our neural connections and changing the frequencies with which our neural uh, neurons fire, that we don't see the world in a different way that may actually provide that doorway into God, uh, you know, universal consciousness or whatever. So I'm not saying it does, but I'm just saying that we have to be cautious about how quickly we write off any given experience uh, simply because it's a pathological condition or, uh, you know, or, or somebody's taking a drug. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. It's, I, I think that that's a whole avenue of, of science that we or we're just, just touching on, you know, I remember, I remember reading all the really controversial studies of Timothy Leary when I, when I was young. Right. Um, well, but, uh, you know, and yeah. unfortunately, sometimes people start to take it in ways that are not always oh, appropriate. Yeah, he, yeah, he certainly did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so maybe a bad start, but we can get, we're getting better now with you and David Aiden. Um, correct. Uh, it's, Peggy it's, Tileson uh, writing in, this is actually a really good follow-up question to that. Um, uh, she said, are there neurological differences uh, that you can map out uh, between psychosis and mystical experiences? She obviously said there's cultural differences, but do we, do we actually see a, a difference in brain scans of what, when somebody's going through a psychotic episode? Um, you know, there are some similarities and some differences. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that happens in psychosis tends to be uh, you know, obviously abnormal functioning in the brain. Um, part of the, part of the answer to the question is, is that it, you know, we're generalizing psychoses. I mean, there, there's a lot of types of psychoses and, you know, you can have auditory hallucinations, visual hallucinations, delusions. You can have, you know, uh, different kinds of things that are going on. So it depends a little bit, but just to give sort of one maybe example of that, um, if you have an auditory hallucination, then your hearing centers of the brain turn on, but they also turn on if you're actually hearing someone. So the question is, you know, how do you just, if, if you're just looking at the brain scan, how do you know whether somebody's really hearing something or it's just their auditory cortex that's firing that's making them feel like they're hearing something. And so that in and of itself is a challenge to figure out, uh, you know, where the real reality is. And of course, one could argue, back going back to the, the psychedelic argument, who is to say that they're not hearing something from some other way of hearing things that, you know, I mean, obviously a dog can hear a high pitched sound that we can't hear. Um, so, you know, how do, we, how do we make that differentiation? One of the problems um, has been that uh, there's been sort of an over pathologizing of spiritual experiences in part because there are those, no, you know, everyone knows of the, you know, the crazy inpatient, uh, you know, who believes that they're Jesus Christ or something like that. Um, so, you know, there, there's that piece to it. But, um, but I think we have to be careful in saying, well, you know, because there are some schizophrenics who believe they're the Messiah, um, that everyone who has some kind of intense spiritual experience has some kind of, you know, delusion or brain disorder or something like that. Uh, and, and yet, once again, you know, I would argue, how do you know that that brain disorder isn't somehow allowing a person to engage the world in a way that the kind of the quote unquote normal brain is not. And, um, and, it, and it leads to a whole other issue in, in just the field of psychiatry, which is how do we define what normal is and what abnormal is. Absolutely. Um, and so, uh, you know, if I say abnormal is hearing the voice of, you know, hearing a voice that isn't there, then by definition, anyone who says I heard the voice of God is, is psychotic. Um, but a lot of people, when they say I heard the voice of God, they don't mean it in the same way as, as a schizophrenic who says, I'm hearing voices. Um, and, and also, in, in many cases, the, the spiritual experiences are viewed very positively, while, you know, most of the time, the schizophrenic will say, no, those voices are a problem. You know, those right. Are and they, yeah, they, yeah, I, I worked in a, a lockdown unit for, for two years, and, and most of the voices of schizophrenics are, are, are not welcome, uh, according to them. Absolutely. There's exactly. a difference, yeah. Um, uh, you're reminding me of the, the the controversial and great book, The Three Christ of Ypsilanti. Um, from, <laughs> so uh, um, this is a, a, a question I'm really fascinated in here, what you think of this and uh, being from the uh, Department of Religious Studies, and you know, we talk about this a lot. Um, and this question is coming from Anna, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, uh, Defendini. And um, how does evolution, are, are, are human beings, have we evolved to have these experiences, you know, or is there a homo religioso? Like, you know, uh, 
is it is is I what I think is she's asking is is this an evolutionary advantage that human beings have developed the ability to have these types of, of mystical experiences? I mean, obviously we don't know if a dolphin or a chimpanzee is having experiences like this, right? But um, could this be connected to evolution and are certain brains are we finding wa more wired for this than others? Um, so all, all really just great, great questions. Um, you know, the original work that I did was with uh, a fellow by the name of Eugene DeQuilly, who's a psychiatrist at Penn and uh, by training was also had a PhD in anthropology. So a lot of our early work did look at the evolutionary uh, origins of religious practices. And a lot of the work was based on rituals, um, which, you know, arguably uh, he wrote a book called Spectrum of Rit Ritual back in the 70s um, and talked about animal rituals mm. that apparently mating rituals, but, but the goal of those mating rituals are to bring animals together. And so the, you know, the ability to connect with something. And so the elaboration of rituals into humanity, uh, human beings, and then ultimately, you know, religious and spiritual rituals, as well as rituals in, in, in other parts of our lives, really help us to make that kind of a connection. Now, others have argued um, that there are a variety of possible adap uh, adaptive advantages of religious and spiritual beliefs and, and systems. Uh, for example, um, you know, people argue that uh, that religions provide a sense of morals, a sense of, you know, to create a cohesive society. Um, I've always remarked that, you know, to my knowledge, there's never been a civilization that has ever developed without some kind of religious or spiritual program or system in place. Cool. Um, so, so to a large extent, um, it seems to be kind of built into the brain. Uh, it seems to be something that is kind of a, a part of how we how our brain operates and works, and, and we've argued for that as well. But, um, but part of what uh, the challenge, I think, and part of why I've actually steered away from it a little bit is, it's a little, to ask what is the adaptive advantage of it um, is a little bit of a futile uh, argument because, you know, the, I, I can't prove that it, you know, it was because it created morals that that was why religion became a part of our brain. Um, However, you know, again, there are some really, uh, there still may be some ways of, of sort of truly identifying what is, what were the adaptive advantages of it, but, but we have to do that very carefully and cautiously and think about that. But, um, but, you know, by the same token, you know, I know you said like dolphins, you know, may or may not, we don't know, but we do know that Neanderthals, you know, buried their dead mm -hmm. and did so with, you know, flowers and trinkets and painted them and things like that. So they clearly thought that there was something more than just the physical body. I mean, we obviously don't know what their belief system may have been, but it seems like they're, they were operating on a principle that there was something more going on than just what was going on with the physical body. Um, there are some really fascinating um, cave art that goes back about 30,000 years that some scholars have argued are representative of mystical journeys. Um, so, you know, there, I, there, there's this sort of, evidence that there is a connection between the evolutionary development of humanity and the, the value of what, what goes on with regard to religious and spiritual experiences. Now, you know, how adaptive it was and whether or not, um, you know, it was an epiphenomenal adapt adaptation that the more we thought about different questions and solve problems that we started to ask, you know, bigger questions about why is the world here and you know, why are we here and what happens when we die and all that. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating topic. And again, books have been written on it, but, um, but I think, you know, there's definitely, uh, uh, you know, some reasonable arguments to be made about the adaptive elements to it. And, and we've argued that, um, that on a very fundamental level, our brain tries to do two main things for us. It helps us to survive and helps us maintain ourselves and it helps us to transcend ourselves from one moment of life to, to the next, to change and adapt. And religion seems to match very well to those two basic functions. Religion and spiritual traditions help us to survive all the things that I just said, um, but they give us a sense of control, a sense of how we are to uh, operate as human beings. Um, and then uh, religions also help us with transcendence. Uh, and I don't mean that necessarily in the enlightenment transcendence, um, but you know, just from, from stages of life. I mean, there's all kinds of religious rituals that rites of passage and birth rituals and, uh, you know, growing up rituals and marriage rituals and death rituals that are all part of religious tradition. So, um, you know, plus it also does offer that sort of ultimate transcendence, that 
that ability to get to something more than what we are today. So um, I, I think that there very much could be uh, a, a very powerful kind of evolutionary process that might be involved. But again, you know, to take the other side as well, um, you know, if one is religious, one would certainly argue that it makes sense that we would have a brain that can perceive religion and can perceive God. It would be sort of silly if, you know, God was up there and we were down here and um, we didn't have an apparatus for being able to understand what God was and communicate with God. So uh, whether you go down a purely evolutionary path or a purely religious path, uh, I think to me, we can understand why religion and spirituality is a part of the brain. And that leads to sort of the last part of that question, which is, you know, do some people are have sort of a, a greater predisposition to it or predilection for it? And I think that that's true of virtually every aspect of humanity that, um, you know, some people are better at mathematics than others and some people are better at music than others. Um, if all of us uh, tried to play music, you know, eight hours a day, we'd all get pretty good at it. But there's still going to be those people who are the Mozarts of the world because there's just something unique about them that's different. And I think, you know, similarly, if we all prayed and meditated uh, every day for hours on end, uh, there would be a lot of compassion and, and uh, meditative uh, abilities going on. But there's still going to be those people who just kind of get it in a different way. And, and I think that that still, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, that still supports the whole idea. I mean, it's still a part of who we are. But there are, you know, there is a, a continuum of that. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Dr. Towson, do we still have time for a couple more questions? I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, I I want to take uh, one question. This is just this discussion is so rich, I, and these questions are so wonderful. Um, uh, Annie Hartford is asking, how do out of body experiences fit in here? So um, what we have argued, uh, and, and you know, there is some data for this, is that um, <laughs> it goes back to the parietal lobes, we think, that, um, that on, uh, in the parietal lobes, because they are involved in our spatial representation of ourself and how we are kind of how we exist within space. So the parietal lobes turn on and that helps us to get up out of the chair and walk through the doorway and so forth. Um, the parietal lobes, particularly the one on the left, is a little bit more about self-other. And may actually have a bit of a representation, like almost a homunculus, as we would say in the medical world, uh, like a little sort of spatial representation of our body. So we at one point made an argument that out-of-body experiences may represent a kind of like, like a flipping, if you will, of this spatial perception of the self so that you feel like you're somewhere else. And that that is what creates that out-of-body experience. And people have found some really interesting ways of kind of replicating that. Like if you put your hands in front of you and then um, they sort of they sort of show you an image of your hands and then they stroke one hand you know visually but but they actually do it physically as well you ultimately will think that this this sort of phantom hand is really your hand mm. um, so, so there's some really interesting ways of kind of manipulating the brain to flip how we feel our body um, and we have this whole thing called proprioception which helps us to feel where our body is. And that, you know, there are disorders where that, you know, we get damage to the parietal lobes there, where we get what's called neglect and people think that their leg doesn't belong to them anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, there are some ways of thinking about that, but yes, out-of-body experiences are an important part uh, of some of the, you know, kind of the, the broader discussion of these kinds of experiences and a common element of like near-death experiences. Uh, so uh, people have been trying to explore them and, uh, you know, one of the, the really interesting questions is, uh, is it purely a brain phenomenon or did your consciousness really leave your brain? And mm -hmm. some people are doing research to look at that. You know, they're trying to see, you know, if you have an out-of-body experience through a near-death experience, um, can you really prove and corroborate what they're describing when they look down and they say, well, the nurse had red hair and the doctor said this and all that. Um, can we, you know, there's a lot of anecdotal uh, stories about the accuracy of those reports, um, but whether or not we can prove that that out-of-body out uh, experience happened, um, people are working on that. Yeah, that's right. That's fast. That's, I would love to see that study. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, so Kenneth Berlin is asking, and this is a, this is a question certainly is important for religious studies. Um, are, do you find that people talk, I guess, talk about the intensity of these experiences? Are they more intense in isolation or in communal settings? Yeah. Um, you know, that is something we have uh, 
uh, thought about addressing in some way. Um, you know, there are some ways of doing studies with the brain and, um, and doing that. And uh, I don't know if fundamentally they are more intense one way or the other. Uh, some people do find a value in obviously in that strength and whether it's a group of monks who are sitting around together versus, you know, a monk sitting in individual isolation. Um, I mean, arguably speaking, uh, you can have very intense experiences both ways and you can have a mystical or enlightenment experience either way. Um, I guess part of the answer that I, one of the things is, which may be a difference, is that if you are seated by yourself, um, you can maintain that state for an indefinite period of time. Arguably speaking, people could leave the room, you know, Anya. <laughs> so, um, so at some point, um, if you're in a group setting, it's harder to maintain the group setting because people can leave. But I don't think, you know, in terms of the actual fundamental intensity of those experiences, uh, I think they can be every bit as intense. And, um, and of course, in many ways, those kinds of group uh, experiences are a part of what many religious rituals are all about, going to church, going to synagogue, um, you know, taking part together in a ceremony. And, uh, and of course, so much of the problem in the pandemic of not being able to do that. So, uh, you know, but, but we actually talk about that in the context of religions and, and how people sort of think about their own religiosity. Um, you know, how much is it an introverted kind of religiosity and that they just pray and they do everything on their own versus a more extroverted type of form where they like to be with the group and they like to do things together and so forth. And, and it comes down a little bit more to the individual, I think, you know, some people just find it uh, better one way or the other. And, and it just, it just depends. I would have to say, I, I think my students are often surprised when I tell them that, you know, the image we have of the Buddhist nun or monk, like meditating alone in a cave is, is quite rare in, in right. is that most experience of meditation experience are with a teacher, with small groups, or sometimes even large groups. And, and right. the, the solitary meditation is, is, is the outlier out there. Yeah, um, and it also goes back to that whole discussion that we had about the autonomic nervous system. I mean, when you're saying, and I'm making this up, but you know, if you're saying OM together and you're hearing people around you all saying it, there's a resonance in your brain. You, you have mirror neurons in your brain that reflect what other people are doing around you. And so right. you pick up on that. And, um, and of course, you know, there arguably if we're, you know, if consciousness can somehow go beyond the brain, then, you know, even more so uh, does that uh, play out in terms of, you know, the consciousness is sort of commingling, right. if you will, but, but even on a, just a biological level, just the hearing and the feeling and the, you know, the sounds and the breathing and the, and all that, um, can be very, very powerful and, and, and really can drive that autonomic nervous system. It's a spiritual surround sound, right? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> um, exactly. Well, and, and even the settings, I mean, obviously, you know, the, the gorgeous churches and mosques and so forth, you know, there, there's a lot to be said for just the aesthetics and how that affects the brain. And uh, we've written some stuff on um, sacred architecture and uh, those the effect of that on the brain. Well, it's, it's, it's funny. I wrote, I, I wrote a book on architecture not too long ago, and, and I always, I commented in that book, and, and I mentioned that, you know, even, you know, even when I walk into, I grew up Catholic and spent a lot of time in Buddhist monasteries, even when I walk into a Catholic cathedral or, or a Buddhist monastery, and I'm completely alone, and there's no religious ceremony, I'll still whisper. You know, yeah. Like, you know, like why? And I will still like lower my head. Like, why am I doing this? Like, no one's saying it, or you know, like. Um, but yeah, the, the room. Well, and uh, one of the things, thing, it, you know, this is something that we it, it didn't get into in quite an elaborate way. But when you meditate, you know, what you're doing ultimately is sort of blocking sensory input from getting into these parietal lobes, so they shut down, and then you lose your sense of self. Well, you know, architecture can do that physically. Mm what you just said, they're, they, be, they sort of suck out the noise and they, they make the space huge. So when you walk into it, you kind of lose your spatial relationship and you lose the sensory input, the sound and the, and the visual so that you feel this sort of expansion. And that's, that's what's happening in your parietal lobe. So it just does it physically instead of you doing it through a meditation practice. Right, well, building, buildings have agency, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah, that's, that's great. Um, we have time. I actually have to go give another talk in three minutes. So, <laughs> I mean, it's I'm not, I have to give a talk myself in three minutes, um, but I will get uh, this, uh, uh, a question here. And I know we're over time anyway, but a question from Michael uh, Ferragamo.
Um, can epileptic seizures lead to spiritual awakening? I recall Dostoevsky described in The Idiot entering states of oneness during temporal lobe seizures. Yeah, well, you know, it's, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about seizures. Um, there have been some examples of people who have temporal lobe seizures, who have unusual religious experiences or, or religious, uh, you know, attitudes. Um, there's a couple of issues with that. Yes, there are some of those examples, but um, there are lots of people who have temporal lobe seizures who do not have unusual religious experiences. And so, um, you know, while it's interesting and it's helpful and it tells us the importance of the temporal lobe in these experiences, uh, we have to be careful about over pathologizing again. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we certainly don't want to make the argument that, well, everyone who has a religious experience is having some kind of temporal lobe epilepsy or something like that. There's really no evidence to support that. Uh, and interestingly, people who have epilepsy in other areas of the brain also have had reports of unusual religious experiences too. So, um, so it's, it's interesting and it tells us something. It's a, I always talk about neurotheology as being kind of a big, a big jigsaw puzzle. So, you know, psychedelics, uh, pathological conditions like epilepsy, meditation, you know, these are all pieces of the puzzle that get us to learning more about what these experiences are, how they happen, and how they are linked to what's going on in the brain. But there's not one answer, I think, that uh, is going to tell us, you know, there's not one way of doing it. And, and we really think that it's almost, you know, it's every part of the brain that seems to ultimately become involved in these experiences. That's great. That's, that's, that's a really good, I, you know, coming from the humanities and being, you know, just deep in the swamp of, of, the, of, of the humanities. And the last math class I took was, was long division. So, so this, this is how far I am from, you know what I mean? And, and uh, I have severe dyslexia. So any numbers, um, so I, I always think it's very refreshing to hear a scientist say that there's multiple answers and we don't know because I see that as a humanist all the time. So um, that may, that makes it so in neurotheology. So we're combining the two the two fields. Exactly. Um, there's been so many great questions. David Collins had a lot of questions and Frank had a lot of questions. So they're they're really good, very detailed. You know what? Um, if really, uh, you know, they can go to my website, so okay. andrewguberg.com, um, and um, there's a way to connect with me and. Uh, be patient with me because I get a lot of things through there, but I'm happy to try to answer them and, and, and love to hear from people. Yeah, John and Ashok and really good good stuff. And sorry, the very detailed questions that I that I uh, that I, I didn't think we had time for. Um, Is that a but, um, but, uh, but, um, but thank you very much, uh, Professor Tyson. Did you want to do want to say anything uh, to uh, to uh, end off the discussion? Well, just first of all, thank you so much, and I honestly think we could probably sit here for another two hours. Um, sure. You know, I'm willing to hold the space a little bit longer. I know Justin has to leave. I don't know if, um, Andrew, if you do. If you I'm going to probably off. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. I hope this is actually the first um, of more conversations around this topic. And um, it's one of my favorite spaces to be, which is in like, in between all of these um, kind of thoughts from science as well as um, the mystical side of things. So thank you. And um, I guess I will stay on after you both have to leave in case anybody else has a few more questions we wanna talk about. Wonderful. All right, so thank, you, thank you, Dr. Newberg. Thank you to the audience. Thank you both. For everyone paying attention and uh, I'd love to hear from you and uh, we'll do it again soon. Thank you.